Tak. Good morning. Are you expecting God to speak to you in a personal way today? Have you decided what you're going to do with what God is going to speak to you today? Yeah. Think about that as well. Right, so... So last week, John was, I mean, the week before last, John was sharing about the cost of being in the kingdom of God, right? So the cost of being a follower of Jesus, a disciple, the cost of being part of the kingdom. Um, so yeah, you can, can pull up the slides maybe uh, while that's coming up. Yeah. So today we're going to take a step back and now that we've understood the cost, so after understanding the cost comes a decision about following Jesus, right? So what does it mean to actually follow Jesus? And if you're aware of the cost, are we willing to decide to follow Jesus? Now perhaps I'm in the wrong place. I shouldn't be preaching in a church about following Jesus because all of us follow Jesus. So we'll dwell a little in, into that, deeper into that, and try to understand what it means to follow Jesus and look at our lives and see, if, see what God speaks to us. So this is what was covered last time and so let me ask a question. Um, do we all believe in Jesus? We're all believers, right? We all, everybody here I'm sure is a believer in Jesus. The next question is, are you a follower of Jesus? Uh, you may have a question, is there a difference between a believer and a follower? Is it not the same? Right? It could be. It depends on how we define one who believes and one who follows. But there, there can also be a difference. And it's important for us to understand the difference so that we look at our lives the right way. Now, let me say, talk about three things. Right? Three things that happen to a person who, let's say, doesn't believe. The first thing is he or she hears the good news, right? Here's the truth. Here's the gospel. That's number one, right? So many people haven't even heard. They don't know the truth. They don't know Jesus. So number one is to hear. Number two is to believe what has been heard, right? So, so there's a choice there. It's a point of decision. Either I can reject that, say it doesn't make sense to me. I choose not to believe. Or I can say it makes sense to me. I choose to believe. What does that mean? It means that I believe what? I believe whatever is in the Bible. I believe the words of Jesus. So I believe Jesus to be the Son of God and everything that he said he was. I believe he came down as a man and died on the cross, rose up again. I believe all of that. Right? It doesn't end there. There's a third which is to follow. And follow who? follow Jesus. Now out of these three, it's only the last one that's personal, that's relational. The first two are a little bit intellectual, right? In, I hear, right? I think with my mind, I believe, I can intellectually agree with all those doctrines and I choose to believe that that's the truth. But it's only when I follow Jesus, that's the the personal part of it, right? Where I am following a person. And that's the end state that defines a believer or a follower or a disciple, a person in the kingdom of God, right? It's not the first, it's not the second. You can think back to the, the parable of the sower, right? Where uh, you remember there's this seed that is sown into different types of places. One fell on the rocky ground, one fell on the wayside, one fell among thorns, one fell in good soil. And, you know, one didn't even, and all of them heard, right? So they all had the first, one didn't believe, the one on the, the roadside, right? that Satan came and took away the seed that was sown, didn't even believe. The other two believed. And the one among thorns, it, it grew, you know, it 
started growing and looked good. But then the person didn't really follow. There wasn't a relation. When things went bad, times of difficulty, it withered away. It's only the fourth that actually grew. It went, did all of these three, right? So it's a little bit like this, where a person believes, right? It suddenly clicks in his mind. He believes. But then the follower of Jesus not just believes, but also follows. There's an action of following. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? Are you following Jesus? Are you following Jesus? Uh, to answer that, you need to know what it means to follow Jesus. Right? Now, of course, we say, yes, of course I follow Jesus. Right? I wouldn't be sitting in church today. I'd be sleeping at home if I wasn't following Jesus. All right, let, let's, let's, let's go ahead. I didn't even open my notes yet. Okay. Right. Now, what does it mean to follow somebody? So when, let's look back at Jesus, right? Um, or anybody, if there's somebody, what does it mean to follow? Nowadays there's follows on social media as well, but, but all of that, what does it mean to follow somebody? What is it? It's not so difficult question. It's an easy question, right? Sorry? Obedience? Obedience, okay. But what does it mean to follow somebody? Not God, maybe, but anybody. When you follow somebody, what do you do? Uh -huh. Imitate, follow, yeah, imitate, be like. So first and foremost, you accompany the person, right? You want to go where the person's going. So when you follow somebody on LinkedIn or whatever, you want to keep aware of whatever this person posts, right? You kind of want to, in the social world, accompany the person. So when you follow somebody in real life, you choose to walk with the person, right? You accompany. And in doing that, we observe, we learn, right? We, we follow, we become like, right? Um, so there's, you see, there's, a, there's an aspect of a personal relationship. It's not intellectual, right? I can't, your intellectual is when I can stay at a distance, right? But to follow this, I have to actually walk with. I have to go with, right? I have to know the person. And uh, if you can turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, um, if somebody who has a mic can read Luke 9, 59 to 62. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Thank you. All right, so this is, this is a very, very important set of verses for us to understand following Jesus and also to understand what may be keeping us from following Jesus, right? This is key for us to be able to evaluate ourselves. So when Jesus told these people, so he told them this, this is not a parable, this is a true life incident. Jesus tells two people, follow me. When Jesus said that, what was he actually asking them to do? In other words, if you had to paraphrase, follow me, how would you paraphrase it? It would be something like, like we just said, come with me, right? Walk with me, be with me, accompany me, and then I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll work together, right? Get to know me, and I'll get to know you. That's what Jesus was calling these people to, right? Now, is it a big deal? Uh, the, the God of creation comes to somebody and says, follow me. Right? It's like being selected into IIT or IAM. You get something prestigious, right? Much bigger than that, of course. Right? It's something that in the Old Testament, people really wanted to do, but they couldn't. 
God never said, follow me. God said, stay at a distance. Don't come near me. You'll die if you come near me. Right? But things changed. So how do these people respond, these two? How do they respond? Well, how, what does the verse say? How is their response? Both of them said, let me first. Right? Let me first. Really important for us to understand. They didn't say no. Right? They didn't say no. They said yes. They said yes. We w I'm willing to follow you, Jesus. Thank you so much. But let me first go and... Right? Look at both the verses. Look at both their responses. It starts the same way. Let me first go and. Right? It doesn't matter what comes after that. It's irrelevant. It can be anything. Right? But let me first is what keeps us from following Jesus Christ. And as we look into this aspect of following Jesus Christ, we look into one particular aspect today. Right? And we'll come to that in a moment. So what was their problem? What kept them from following Jesus right away? You know, you can, you can actually quickly look at Matthew 9, 9, turn your Bibles to Matthew 9, 9. And uh, let's, you know, look at some other instances quickly of people to whom Jesus said, follow me. Same words, right? Because it's important for us to know that there's a choice when Jesus tells us, follow me. And the choice is not always between yes and no, right? That's an easy choice. None of us here have said no. But there's also another choice, right? So look at Matthew 9, uh, 9. So this is where, uh, and as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to them, said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. What was he doing? He was working. He was in his office, right? He was doing his work. And Jesus just comes by and says, has the audacity to say, follow me. No, but I, I'm working, right? Don't you understand that, Jesus? I, I finished my work at 7 p.m. I'll follow you then, right? No, he didn't say that. Jesus said, follow me. He left, he arose and followed him. It's, it's very interesting. Like, Jesus said, follow me. So he left everything and followed him. As if that's the logical thing to do, right? All right, Matthew 4, 18 to 20. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left the nets and followed him. What were they doing? Working. Uh, yeah, They were working. They were earning their living, livelihood. They don't have probably food if they don't fish. and you know, They're fishermen. What do they do? Jesus said, follow me. Again, Jesus has the audacity to just come when they're doing something important. He said, follow me. This is where they immediately left the nets and followed him. Right? So you see there's two contrasts. And again, it's not between yes and no. It's between yes right away and let me first. Right? And the let me first never end. Right? I'm sure all of us have experienced that in our lives. When we feel like praying, feel like reading the Bible, right? Let me first just check my phone. Let me first just go put that on the stuff, right? And then while that cooks, I'll come and pray. It's efficient, right? Let me first check if I have some email and get that off peace of mind. The let me first never end. Right? I'm sure we can all relate to this. But you see there's a choice. There's a choice that's in the Bible, right? There's precedence in the Bible. Because this is what Satan does, right? Let me first is a, is a ploy of the enemy. And we need to see that, right? Now, so what was the problem of these people going back to Jesus when these two people who said, let me first, what was actually the problem? Was it unbelief? Did they not believe that Jesus is Messiah? 
No, they believed, right? Was it a problem of um, a lack of desire to follow? No, they didn't say no. They wanted to follow, right? They believed. They had the desire to follow Jesus, right? What was the problem then? What is the problem? Okay. Okay. Priority. And the priority played out in their availability, right? So if you if you can, so they didn't they didn't make themselves available right away, right? So you could say actually that. Can just go to the next slide. So the problem was of a problem of availability, right? So if you look at the disciples when they got the call, availability wasn't an issue. They said, "I'm available right now. I don't. It doesn't matter what I'm doing now, right?" There was no "let me first," right? And they they also had the right to say, "Let me finish this. I'm just." pulling some fish let me at least finish pulling this uh, Matthew could have said yeah I'm just doing some accounting I'm just doing some calculation let me just finish this uh, right the problem was of availability and today we'll we we'll look at this aspect of availability because that's key and I think that's something that keeps a lot of us from actually moving from believing to following and Now, these people, right, in these two instances where they said, let me first. Now, we could, we could analyze what comes after that. You know, one, one spoke about a responsibility. One spoke about some relationships with people, key people. It's not about, see, the, the, the aspect of availability is not, a, the point is not about uh, leaving our job and going full-time into ministry. It's not about shunning our responsibilities or any of those things, right? It's, it's not really about what comes after so let me first right but it's about how much do you make yourself available to jesus in a day think of a day your typical day how much time in that day do you make yourself available to jesus right if i ask myself that question the answer is probably zero nil I probably have my prayer time, a few minutes when I read the Bible, and I finish that up, and I get on with, with the day, and all through the day I'm doing my work, I depend on myself, I'm busy. I make myself available to Jesus for zero minutes a day. You can, you can think of yourself and see how many minutes or hours you make yourself available. Now, what does it mean to make yourself available? to Jesus. What do you think it means? Think for a moment, right? So let's just try to answer that question. Um, so being available is not the same as serving. Right? It's not the same as um, doing ministry. Right? That's important to understand. Right? Sometimes we think being available to God means I'm going and serving. I'm going and uh, I'm I'm preparing for something, or I'm doing some ministry. I'm going and doing ministry. Right? That's not primarily what being available really is. Being available first and foremost is being there to sit quietly at the feet of Jesus, like Mary did. Right? Mary and Martha. Martha was busy serving. Mary was there sitting, and Jesus said, "You're doing the right thing. You're being available before Jesus." How much time do you spend a day or a week or a month just being available, saying, Jesus, I'm here. I have no agenda. I have no list of requests. I'm just here. I'm just here for you to do whatever you want with me, for you to speak. Being available after the first one, that's when we can hear what God wants us to do. And then it's being available to do whatever God asks you to do right now serving ministry all of that counts only if it follows from the last right 
God has asked me to do something, to serve, and I go and do it, right? Then that's being available. Otherwise, it's like those people, like we see, you know, in the end, Jesus says, and those people say, Lord, Lord, in your name, I did this, I did that, I served, I did ministry, I healed the sick. And Jesus said, I never knew you. You were never available. You never sat at my feet, right? So you see, it follows from being available. Serving, ministry, it counts for nothing otherwise. Absolutely zero, zilch, right? It's as good as doing nothing. Might as well sleep at home. At least your body gets rest. It doesn't count. And the Bible makes it very evident. We, we saw this a few weeks back right, when we looked at that. What matters is what comes after we make ourselves available to Jesus. And from that, from what God speaks to us, and then we make ourselves available to go and do what, what uh, God asks us to do. Now, there's some of you might know about this person called David Wilkerson. Right? He was he's he's no more. Uh, he passed away a few years back, but he was a he was a great man of God. He lived in New York City. He founded this uh, Times Square Church in New York City, and uh, there's this incident about his life where uh, he was the pastor of this church and. He used to, you know, after a very busy day of work, ministering to people and all of that, he used to come home and watch TV for, for an hour or so in the, in the late evenings. Right? After his family slept, he'd just wind, wind down and he'd watch TV. Now, one day, you know, he, he kind of uh, felt convicted that God saying, you know, this time, one hour or more, you spend every day in front of the TV. You know, what happens if you just make yourself available to me for that one hour? And so he says, okay, could this really be God? And uh, he kind of puts a fleece before God and says, okay, if you really want me to sell my TV and just make myself available to you, I'll put an ad in tomorrow's newspaper. And if somebody calls me within 30 minutes for the TV, seeing the ad, then I'll know that it's from you. I'll sell my TV and I'll spend that hour just being available for you. And his wife, uh, her name is Gwen, and she says, 30 minutes, do you even really want to sell that TV? You know, why don't you just put at least one day or two days, right? Nothing's going to happen in 30 minutes. I, th I think you don't really want to sell that TV. So David says, yeah, I mean, I'm putting a very difficult fleece before God. So he puts the ad in the paper. And the next day, the whole family is sitting and waiting. There's no phone call. There's nothing. He's almost heaving a sigh of relief. When on, on the 29th minute, a f the phone rings. And he picks up the phone and the man says, hey, I saw this ad in the newspaper about your TV. How much are you selling it for? And David suddenly realizes he had not even thought about the, the price the price tag. Right? He suddenly says, okay, $100. And the man says, okay, done. I'm coming there in 15 minutes and I'm going to pick the TV up. Right? And that started a period in his life where he started spending an hour every night being available to God. And through those times of availability, God spoke to him to go to uh, the places in New York City where the gangs operated. And there was this, uh, there was drug, drugs and uh, addictions, and there was these gangs and the fighting there. And he starts going there, and a street ministry starts, and he goes and preaches there. And there's this book, the the cross and the switchblade, that that uh, where he writes about all of this. And many of the the gang leaders are convicted. He sees great and mighty move of God in, in those areas, in those streets, and these people are delivered, right? And uh, many of them follow his, his, his church and join his church, and something you know, big started with just being him deciding to be available consistently every day before God, right? Now, he didn't decide to say, okay, I need to start doing something, I need to start serving, right? He took it the right way, and we learned the right order from his instance, right? It starts with being available. God will tell you what to do. Before God tells you what to do, God might have to work on us, right? There might be things God needs to set right on ourselves. Right? God needs to prepare us, perhaps, right, for what he's calling us. So there's, there's things that God may want us to do. And in these periods of availability, God may first choose to work on us, right? And um there's also this this incident about uh my mother uh, 
um, she suddenly felt like praying for her cousin who lives far away in another country and they don't even talk much they talk very rarely they're, they're far far away the cousin is in canada and uh, she suddenly felt like praying for her and she started praying uh, she prayed for like an hour or so and then that was it right she prayed with a lot of burden and all of that and then that was it things went on uh, nothing happened right? it's about a month or so later when when they got in touch she came to know that on the same day at the same time her cousin met with a very serious accident right her, there was a big truck that rammed into her car and uh, miraculously she survived right how many of you have been in this kind of a situation where you feel like praying for somebody right <clears throat> you feel at this tug saying pray for this person right or go and speak to this person i have felt it too and there have been times when i either just say sometimes i say okay i'll pray at the end of the day right and sometimes i say i say one line of prayer just to get you know for my conscience to be clear i say okay god please be with that person right okay fine i'm i'm clear i did what you asked me to do please don't ask me now we may not have realized the implications of the times when we didn't hear the voice sometimes don't even know sometimes don't even come to know the implic of what's happened when we hear that voice right and sometimes things can't wait when god says do this now we need to do that because there's a reason and god knows god doesn't always tell us everything god says just trust me just just do what i'm telling you to do right you know these kids our kids of us if you tell them to do something say, why why should i do it now why can't i do it later there's all these questions right but god says if if god says follow me it means follow me now there's a reason right something happens if we say let me first we end up never following right there's a story of this uh there's this housemaid uh, my wife was telling me the other day about that she read this story about a housemaid who uh suddenly felt like uh like praying right for for some somebody and she obeys and you know by praying you know, there was this person who was on the verge of taking a decision on whether to believe in jesus or not right so spiritual battle then and as she prays you know that person makes the decision to follow jesus right simple things right but they matter so being available is is uh, different from going to god with a list of requests and going through a prayer and all of that that's not being available that's putting our petitions before god which is fine right but there's a place for all of that right so i hope you i hope you you i am able to convey this about the the importance of the sequence about the importance of taking time to be available for god um now to to conclude we are all broken people right we are all people who are scarred we are broken we carry baggages from the past and from the present we are all people who need to be delivered right need to be set right none of us here are sinless none of us here are perfect and yet god calls us just come and be available right that's all that god asks of us but the enemy comes and says no you first need to set yourself right and only then can you go into god's presence because otherwise he's not you're not going to be acceptable before before him you first go and do something else that's that's similar to let me first right you first do this but that never happens because that's not possible right we can't set ourselves right but what god calls us is come and make yourself available and so the question i want to put before all of us including myself today is how many minutes a day are you willing to make yourself available to jesus how many minutes do you have to spare not even talking about hours start with minutes right if one hour is too much 
What about 30 minutes? If 30 minutes is too much, what about 15 minutes? If 15 minutes is too much, what about 5 minutes? If 5 minutes is too much, we need to set things right. right? Something is totally wrong. Right? But start. When I tried spending 5 minutes to make myself available to God, no agenda, just there before God said, God, here I am at your feet. It wasn't easy. Even five minutes is not easy because it's like we have to build our stamina, the spiritual stamina of waiting. Waiting doesn't come easy. In today's life especially, waiting doesn't come easy. And waiting in the presence of God is something that I realized I wasn't used to doing. Right? I was just not used to, to sitting five minutes quietly, without an agenda, not speaking silently before God. And a lot of distractions come in, a lot of thoughts come in. But to just close all that out, to keep the phone aside. And if somebody calls me, I'm not available for that, right? I'm not available for, for whoever wants to call me. It's not easy when we start with, but neither is anything that we start with, right? It's like preparing for a marathon running, right? It's not easy when you start, but you build your stamina, you build, and you're soon able to run five kilometers and 10 kilometers. So are you willing? to start how many ever minutes you choose to make yourself available before God and who knows that might be the start of mighty things that God does not just in our lives but in the lives of people around us in our families in our society forget about everything else start with this Think about this, right? And think about those two sets of people who responded differently when Jesus said, follow me. Right? The call to being available to Jesus. That's the same call that today God puts before us. Saying, follow me by making yourself available for a few minutes a day. And soon we will learn to follow Jesus all through the day to be available even while we are doing things, to be available even while whatever we are doing, right? Soon, and that's what it means to walk in the Spirit. But it starts somewhere. And the reason we aren't walking in the Spirit, and the reason why we, we aren't following Jesus the way we should, is because we haven't started, right? We have to start somewhere, right? Um, in, in closing, I just want to go to this verse in, in John 15. Where Jesus says this, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. See, abiding is making ourselves available, right? Abiding is following. Without this, Jesus says, you can do nothing. By this the Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So you see, being a disciple of Jesus Christ is related to abiding with Jesus Christ. Abiding with is being available, is following, right? It starts there. You can't be a disciple. You can't bear fruit. You can't do anything if it doesn't start with abiding. It doesn't start with being available. If anyone does not bear fruit, which means does not abide, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. So you see the opposite of abiding and making yourself available to Jesus is not staying as a nominal believer. The opposite is being cut out and being cast into fire. The choice between let me first and here I am right now, I mean, it's the same as yes and no. Right? We need to understand that. Right? There is no nominal believer. There is no category of disciple and follower and believer. Right? That's all a lie of the enemy. Right? There's only either you're a follower of Jesus Christ or you're not. Right? We need to understand that. And uh, I'll end here and I'll request Rakesh to, to come and lead us in prayer in this aspect. And uh, I pray that the word that God has spoken to us today, in whatever way God may have convicted you, I pray that Satan will not steal this away and that we would act on it because mighty things will happen when you do.